I don't know about you, but Stacy and I have some pretty big things going on right now in our life. Anybody relate to that? It seems like personally and professionally and ministerially and spiritually, there are, I don't know, it's like a critical day and a critical month and a critical year that we're on the cusp of. Just big, life-transforming, ministry-impacting, mission-critical kinds of things. Anybody relate to that? Big stuff. Anybody have big events that you're, you're either in or just past or is looming large in your immediate future? Big events? Yeah. <laughs> Tim's back to going, my PhD is almost done. So uh, I, that's kind of the, the backdrop, if you will, of, of what I want to talk about tonight. We're house selling and house buying and negotiating some things and deal making and ministry shaping and church reaching and mission achieving and doing life transforming things with us and with other churches and with other teachers and in our own lives and in some friends' lives. Uh, we have people uh, close to us that have graduations this week. That's a huge transition. People that are leaving the house. We have people that have uh, in our lives that have lost someone recently um, and are dealing with that transition and, and obviously the mourning and heartache of that. We, so just big things, you know, changing houses, changing jobs, um, ministry opportunities. Just I, I don't know what your life necessarily looks like. I know what a lot of your lives look like, but it just seems like right now there's these big things going on. In fact, uh, whether it's good or bad, good things that are looming, bad things that are looming, at least what we think of as bad, uh, we often are going to be tense and stressed in the anticipation of how all of that's going to turn out. And Paul, in Ephesians 2, is going to start laying out sort of, okay, if that's the context of our life, we need to understand the big things that God is doing. So I, I want to talk about that. The, the biggest issues in our life, in the midst of what look like big circumstances, what are the big things that God is doing in our life? Um, and I was thinking and praying about this as I was looking through Ephesians 2 again today and kind of refining my notes. And my practice is often to sort of exegete a passage. So I go through and write down things that I know and can tell from what it's saying. And then I go back and figure out what my message will look like. So I was in between those things. and I was thinking, okay, what, what would illustrate this? And so here's what I did. I, I grabbed a, a photo off of our wall and I thought I would bring it and use it as a really challenging for me anyway. Object lesson. So here you go. Here's our picture. I can do this without breaking something. So there you go. And immediately you might go, why is she with him? Because, you know, she looks great. You know, so immediately you're going to look at the people. Can you all see that? Immediately you're going to see the people, the focus of the, the picture. And you're going to look at the, at the individuals. And then hopefully I'll distract you from that really quickly. Once you see the people and they look good or bad or, you know, then you start to go, well, where are they, right? Where is that photo? What, where, what am I looking at? What's the context? And you look at the circumstances or the context uh, of what's happening. And, and then if you, you know, this is actually, was this in Ireland? I think this was in Ireland. And, and so you start to go, oh, okay, I, what beautiful water and wow, it's blurred in the background. And wow, those colorful buildings and there's some trees and you start to, and then because you've looked at the, the object of the photo, the people, and then you've looked at the context of those people, then you start to go, well, that's well put together or not, right? They're, how they're framed and the colors in the photo and look how they put it on the canvas and what's in focus and not in focus. You start to think about the photo itself. And if you think very long about the photo, if you think it's really good, it was well put together, good colors, good framing, good composition, then you think, well, who took that photo? That's, that's good. Obviously, Mike didn't take it. He's in the photo. And Stacy didn't take it. She's in the photo. Who were they with that took that photo? Is that a stranger passing by? Because that's a well, pretty well put together photo. And then you decide what you think of the person who took it. So you start off with the individual or the object of the photo. You then look at the context or the circumstances of the object. Then you start to look at the, not just the circumstances of it, but the photo itself if there's any artistry to it whatsoever. And then eventually you're starting to think, well, if that's the case, if, it, if it's really bad, you're like, who did they get to take that photo? What a shame that they put that on canvas. You know, it didn't look very... So what, regardless of if it's good or bad, you tend to look at the object, the context, how well it's done, and then who is it that did it? Good or bad? Does that make sense? 
And I think so often we think the biggest issue in our lives are these looming circumstances, right? The, the you know, buying the house, the selling the house, the looking for property, the who's going to build it or can we afford to build it or that's us this week, this weekend. And the ministry events and am I going to go there, am I going to be there and how long can I be out of town and who's visiting when and what's that going to look like and what am I going to teach on? These circumstances, whether it's me in my circumstances, or the circumstances that I'm in, we are not the big issue in our life. And it's not even the outcome, what the photo looks like when we're done. That's not even the biggest issue of our life. The biggest issue of our life is who's taking the photo? Whose image is it that we're living in? And I think Paul's going to show us in Ephesians 2 that the work of art that God is making of our life is really not about us, or the circumstances that we're so eclipsed by, right? We're daunted by the circumstance. So we're either thinking about us or the obstacle or the opportunity all the time, the loss or the gain of the moment. It's not about us and it's not about the circumstance. It's not even about the outcome, what the finished product is going to look like. What he's trying to do is create something that speaks of him as the artist. And we get to participate in what he's going to produce, what he's going to do that speaks of him. And so it's hard for us to get outside of ourselves like we were looking at our life as a photo. But Paul's going to talk about this. And so I, I think, I may have to take that down. It may distract me too much to see me sitting there. But I think we're going to talk about what it looks like for us to see the purpose of our life, the canvas of our life from God's perspective. We put this on canvas, it works really well, it sticks off the wall, gives it a little 3D effect. I like it a lot, it brings out enough of the detail and blurs the background. We chose a canvas to put this photo on because of its size and placement of where we have it in the home and what we wanted it to look like. And I think God has done that for you and I. He's chosen not just the context of your life, but even the fabric, what it is like and what it is not like for the purpose he wants to fulfill. And it's going to speak of him in the end and not of you, not even of the result. Okay, so look with me in Ephesians chapter 2, and we're going to go really verse by verse through verses 1 to 10. And the very first verse in Ephesians 2, hopefully you got caught up if you have the study notes, you've gotten caught up on what uh, we've been talking about up till now. And in chapter 2, verse 1, he says just... It's kind of like a cold uh, splash of water. He says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Now, why would he say that? He, he's saying, you're not now, but you were. And I think the biggest, talking about what's big in our life, what looms large, the biggest problem for the unbeliever, the biggest problem for an unbeliever in this temporal life is they don't know how dead they are. They're in their trespasses, they're in their sins, and they're dead in their trespasses and sins, and they don't realize how dead they are. They don't realize their need for life because they don't realize they're lacking life. They're still hoping for life from the very trespasses and sins that he's talking about in that verse. And we're going to see how they try to draw life through trespass and sin. He's going to kind of exegete this for us, or I'm going to exegete what he said, I guess. Uh, they're trying to draw life from their circumstances and the very nature of trying to draw life where there is no life, trying to cause life where there is no life, trying to be the source of life where God is not being the source of life. That is the very nature of sin trying to be the cause of our own solutions, trying to be the one that accomplishes what we need is the very nature of sin. So if I'm trying to draw life from how well people like me in my job, or if I'm trying to draw life by a barter relationship with my spouse, I'm going to do what they require so that they'll do what I require. Maybe we can survive that way as if there's enough to go around if we'll just keep feeding off of each other like that every single day. I'm getting my identity from how well my kids behave. That must say something about me. I'm doing better than my parents, right? Or uh, doing how, how well I do my job, whether they recognize me or not, I'm better than the guy in the cubicle next to me, trying to draw life, draw identity, draw value from my circumstances. If I am successful at that, I must be God because I'm able to cause life where I want it. Doesn't that sound like God? So the biggest problem, I believe, biggest problem, looming large in the context of an unbeliever's life, the biggest problem is that they don't know how dead they are. And that may not pertain to anybody in here. We may all know Christ. You may even understand what I mean when I say Christ is your life, at least something of what that means. So what's the biggest problem for a believer? 
If the biggest problem for an unbeliever is that they don't know how dead they are, the biggest problem for a believer is we don't know how alive we are in Christ. The biggest problem, it says, you were dead in your trespasses and sin. You were. You were dead. And our problem is, as an unbeliever, we don't know how dead we are. And as a believer now in Christ, we don't know how alive we are. We're still trying to draw life from circumstances and from our own ability to impact them and get what we need from them and from each other. Our biggest problem, I believe, as a believer, really, if I could sum it up, the biggest thing that we think is looming large in our life is how do I get my needs met because I don't realize how well my needs are met already in Christ. So Ephesians 1 was all about Paul praying how he wants us to have a wisdom and knowledge and perspective that God has of all that we already have and all that we already are and the value that is already ours and the hope to which he's already called us and is accomplishing our life and the power that's already at work for us to experience Christ's resurrected life. And it's, he's not praying that we would have those things. He was praying that we would know what we already have. And so he ends that. Remember, there's no chapter markers when Paul wrote this letter. He's writing a letter. And so he ends going, that's my prayer that you would know this power that's at work in you. And he's describing that power that was at work in Christ is at work in you. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. And the biggest problem I think we have is that we don't realize how dead we were. And so we don't realize how alive we now are. We're trying to get life instead of live from him as our life. We're still, we're not dead in our trespasses and sin, but we're still trying to be God in our circumstances, which is trespass and sin, right? It's me being an affront to him because I want to be the cause of what only he can provide and in fact has provided. See the problem? It's not what we have, it's what we know. It's not what we lack, it's what we don't know. And so Paul's prayer is that we would know what we've got. And then he says, you were dead and you didn't know it. And so now that you've been brought to life, you don't know it. Isn't that crazy? So that's verse one. It's going to be fun, right? He keeps going and he says, you were dead. Here's my question for you. You were dead. So why then and not now? Well, because our source of life has changed. You formerly walked in trespasses and sin. Verse two says... Uh, well, let's put them together. You were dead in your trespasses and sin, verse 1. And then verse 2, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world. And according to the prince of the power of the air. Meaning the enemy of our soul. Meaning Satan himself. Of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. He's saying you were part of a group of people that was walking as the world walks and is programmed by an enemy that wants to destroy us. And since his agenda is our death and we're living according to the rules and system that he set up, then of course our trying to live the way he prescribes according to the world without Christ as our life, then living the way he lives is death because that was his agenda all along. He is lying to us about what life could be so that we're pursuing a life that only produces death. And the better we do at trying to get life from death, then the more we have hope in it and the more we experience something very unlike life in Christ. That was his agenda. So you aren't now, if you're in Christ, you aren't a son of disobedience anymore. You've been reborn, right? You've been remade. The son of disobedience that was Mike Daniel was crucified with Christ and no longer lives, but Christ now lives in me and that changes my source. So the life that I live in this body, I can live by faith. That means dependence. Instead of me being the source, I'm going to trust him to be the source. Live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. My source has changed. My birth has changed. My nature has changed. I was a son of disobedience who lived according to the pattern of the world trying to draw life through trespass and sin. Now, I may still choose to live that way, but my nature has changed. I'm no longer a son of disobedience. I'm a son of what? God. I'm a son of God. You're a child of God. And so your source for life has changed. The problem is we don't know how alive we are in that source. We're still trying to draw life often from some, somewhere else. They're still around though. 
There's a teaching that says, you know what, every, all of humanity was brought into union with Christ. And so when Christ was resurrected, all of humanity was brought into union with God. And he's very much saying, you once were part of those who are still a part of that group of the sons of disobedience. Watch how he says it. You were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which, whoops, I lost my spot, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is when? Now working in the sons of disobedience. We haven't all been brought into the family of God. Only those who, according to John 1, would receive him and believe upon him, change our dependence from us to him. And we don't realize that in doing that, we've entered into his death to the world and our life to God, our resurrection to him. So he's done it. We've been changed. Our, our, our source has been changed. Our birthright has changed. Our nature has changed. But we don't realize what's changed. And so we're in Christ, have a new source, have life, and don't know it. We're struggling for all the things that the world is struggling for. So there's two things I want you to draw out of this. Uh, two takeaways, if you will. Takeaway number one is that they are now. There are people now where you were. And you didn't cause yourself to be there. You were born there. They didn't cause themselves to be there. They were there. And for me, I get frustrated with every traffic jam and every poor customer service thing. and every, I get frustrated with so many things. And we need to understand they are trying to live life according to the system set up by someone wanting them to walk off a cliff every single day. They're obeying traffic signs that cause them to run into each other solically in every single circumstance. They're following rules of living that literally bring them into death in every circumstance, in every moment, in every relationship of every day of their entire life because they are sons of disobedience. They are following after a way of living that is death. And so what should our response be to that? We were born just like them and we've been reborn by the grace of God as something entirely different. How should we feel about those that are where we were? He's going to lay out God's perspective of us and God was never where we've been. He was never operating contrary to his nature. Christ was never trying to draw life from us. He came to give, not take life. To give it more abundantly, not take it from us at our expense. He was never operating by those rules. And so if he, who was never doing that to anybody, responds the way Paul's about to describe, then we should respond with that same compassion and mercy and love. If, in fact, we're not needing to get our needs met from each other. We can afford to participate in God's agenda for those around us who are sons of disobedience and are living according to death. Does that make sense? But that's hard, right? Because who are they running into when they're you know, running in through those solical traffic lights? It's us. Their flesh can ignite our flesh and they get angry and we get self-righteous. And what we need to do is maybe moralize and legislate morality a little less and receive God's life enough to be able to afford to be incarnational in a world that is not very accepting of us. Maybe my battle is not that they would tolerate me, but maybe that by the grace of God, I could tolerate them. There's a lot of talk about tolerance, right? Maybe I need to stop when I don't need to stop and yield when I don't need to yield, right? Maybe what's in my picture needs to be different than what's in their picture since I've in fact changed. Does that make sense? Maybe what's looming large for them, the circumstances that cause them to be so daunted by their life because they can't draw life from their circumstances, maybe I need to see something a little different about what God's doing because I don't need what they need from where they need it because I have a source of it in Christ. Does that make sense? Okay. We were that same way. I love that it doesn't say you operated according to, he says you were according to the course of this world. You were that way. That's who you were and who you are has changed. Not just the way you live, not just the methodology of life. You were according to that and now you are according to something else. Your nature has changed. We don't know how alive we are. Our nature has changed. Not just, we don't just have a better way of getting our needs met. We have a whole different mechanism of living. We are different. 
So take, a number, uh, take away number one is simply that, that they are where we were. Be compassionate. You can afford to. And they can't. They can't. You have abundant supply of the fruit of the Spirit, and they don't. So who's going to make up for their lack? Them? They're wrong. You're right by grace, but still, you're right. They're wrong, and yet they can't afford to pretend. They can't make themselves not wrong. Only you have the margin to tolerate them. We don't need their tolerance. God has given us his tolerance. We don't need it from anybody else. God has given us his compassion. We don't need it from anywhere else. God has given us his mercy and his life and his love and his acceptance and his righteousness. We don't have to legislate anybody else's. Now, I'm not telling you that right isn't right. I'm saying you can legislate morality all day long and all of those people that you're forcing to behave the way you want could still go to hell. We haven't really changed anything eternally. We've just made ourselves more comfortable. We've made the world look more Christ-like without it ever knowing Christ. Godliness without God, which is exactly what Adam wanted in the garden, right? Now, I'm not against laws that legislate morality. I think that's what laws are for. I'm not against enforcement of those laws so that people don't hurt each other, which again is what the laws are for. But I don't think our agenda in life is confined to the circumstances of the canvas of our life. I think that we are about something bigger than our circumstances. Paul's going to continue to talk about that. Takeaway number two is this. If you re reverse engineer this, you know, it, it went forward saying, you were dead and you're not now because you were walking in trespasses and sin. Uh, but why did you walk that way? Well, because you were by nature according to the world and not of God. So there's this, the reason you were dead is because you're in trespass and sin. And the reason you're in trespass and sin is because you were living by the wrong economy of life. And the reason you were doing that is because your nature was designed by your enemy. <laughs> so of course you're going to experience death. See how that? But what if we went the other way? What if we were reverse engineers by saying that since you aren't a son of disobedience, that's not your nature, and you don't operate according to the world, which is according to the enemy's programming of your life for your destruction, which means you're not walking in trespass and sin because you no longer have to. You have a better option for your source. It's just what dead people do. And that's not who you are. Then what does our life look like? Then what does our life look like? If who we are is changed, so we're living by a different economy, so we're no longer needing to be, live in trespass and sin trying to meet our own needs, then, see, doesn't that leave a wonderful empty space? What if I don't have to be the center of my own story? What if I can actually afford, by the grace of God, to enter into other people's picture? What does it look like? He's going to start to unpack this a little bit more. Verse 3 says this. He's still on that same track. Among them, right, there's now an us and them. We're not against them, but there's a them. All right? The dividing line is not between two churches on two opposing, opposing street corners. There's only one body, but not everybody's in the body. There's only one spirit, but that spirit has not brought everyone under, su under subjugation. We all choose submission to the Spirit of God, but not everybody has chosen that. Some will that haven't, and some never will that haven't. Some that have don't know what it looks like. But among them, we too all formerly lived. No one is exempt from our tolerance by grace. We've all been there. That person is evil and self-righteous and full of pride, just like I was. Every time I accuse anybody of anything, that person ran that red light because they're needy and full of themselves, just like I was. Right? I need to finish all of my complaints that way about anybody else, just like I was. Right? Because we all were formerly just like them. And here's what that meant. Verse 3, I'm sorry, I keep jumping off course. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh, which means independence of God, and were by nature children of wrath. In other words, the result of living after the flesh and indulging in the flesh is by nature receiving the wrath that the flesh causes. But uh, even as the rest, he's saying we were just like them, what they're doing, we were doing. Different circumstances, different context. Your picture might have looked a little different, but it was all the same colors. <laughs> right? Here in the same boat that they were in, we were all there. Verse 4, but God, oh, underline that 30 times. 
but God. You couldn't, you couldn't change, you couldn't intervene, you couldn't fix, you couldn't live on a higher level, you couldn't choose to be moral, you couldn't be the producer of your own solutions. You were impotent for change, but God could intervene. The one who didn't deserve to have to is the only one who could, just like you today. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love. So he was merciful, that's what he was, and the reason he was was because of his character, his love, with which he loved us. Even, verse 5, when we were dead in our transgressions, even when we were just like them, right? Dead in our transgressions and sin, living according to the world. Even then, he loved us, and he made us alive, made us alive. You did not come to life. He made you alive. Made us alive together with Christ. He had to make Jesus dead so that when he brought Jesus to life, he could bring you to life with him. Isn't that great? He had to make Jesus, who never deserved death, never chose independence, never pursued the desire of the flesh, indulged in the flesh, lived independently, tried to be his own source. He who could have been his own source gave up being his own source, gave up his authority of being like God, gave up his position and namesake and power and righteousness so that in becoming the sin of the world, he could die in our place and we who were dead could come to life with him. Isn't that great? He had to kill Christ so that bringing him to life, he could bring us to life with him. That's what that verse says. That together with Christ, we could be made alive. Well, when did Jesus need to be made alive? When he died for you. That's the only way we could get there is if he came here and where we were is dead. In a world of death, living by an economy of death because we're causing death. So what did he do? He became sin for us that we in his life together with him, might be the resurrection, the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5. Isn't that great? It's all right there. But God, the great interventionist, the only one who could intercede because he's the only one not stuck in the mire of our own sin and trespass. He also didn't deserve to, but could choose to. Just like us now. He goes on, he describes how this happened. He says, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you've been saved. He gave it to you when you didn't deserve it. You're choosing to receive, we're going to talk more about this, but you choosing to receive the grace of God doesn't merit the grace of God. Your letting him save you doesn't cause him to save you, doesn't earn his salvation. We need to be so careful that our confidence isn't in our faith, but in the object of our faith of Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? My faith is not in my faith. My faith is in what he can do for me in spite of me. Because that's the only way he can do anything for me, is if I let him do it and I stay out of his way. Let him save me instead of me trying to use him to save my circumstances. Make things the way I want. Draw life from somebody else. That's not the business he's in. He's saving me by his grace so he can insert me into his story, his picture, his life, his canvas, that he can claim it all. The object of the photo, the context of the photo, the setting of the photo, and where it's going to hang in the world. He gets to decide what this looks like. The biggest flag, I talk about red flags and flags of our flesh and all, the biggest flag of unbelief, whether it's for me as a believer or for someone that doesn't know Christ at all, an unbeliever, the biggest flag, the biggest warning sign of unbelief is being driven more by our needs, desire of the flesh, indulging in the flesh, is the nature of sin and produces death. So the biggest flag, I wrote it, the biggest warning sign of unbelief is being driven more by our needs than his truth. Being driven more by our needs, driven, right? Wanting the flesh, pursuing the flesh, indulging the flesh, trying to meet our own needs, trying to overcome our own problems, trying to be our own source, or trying to be successful, godly, independent of God causing his behavior, causing what we want in our life and circumstances, the biggest warning sign should, 
you know, a flag isn't even good enough. It's like, if it, I, I used to go to Texas Tech University, and, you know, we'd all have our little flags for Texas, yay, and we'd hold up our, you know, guns up. But when we scored, you know what they did? They put a guy on a horse, and he had a flag like the size, you know, of half the football field, and he went around the track on the horse twice, and this huge, you couldn't miss it, you know, unless you were asleep, you saw this huge flag going by. Fl the word flag is really not good. We need, like, sirens going off. The biggest siren warning sound, tornado coming, the biggest alarm of unbelief is that we're driven more by our needs that he's supposed to be able to take care of than by, our, by his truth. Is he sovereign or are we trying to be sovereign? Is he enough? We sing it all the time. Jesus, you're enough for me. I can't think of the tune. We sing it all the time, right? You're enough. And then we're hoping that by saying that, he'll give us what we really want. Because he's not enough. He's just supposed to be the means to what I want. You've got to be very careful if I am living more from my need than I am from his truth. And I think he uses that to bring us into conflict of what we really believe all the time, all the time. I say that I'm a good God and you're in conflict because I'm not doing what you want. Do you believe me? Or are you just trying to use me to get what you want from your circumstances? Because I'm good whether you're feeling good or not. What do you believe? You're living from my truth? You're living from your feelings? You're living from my truth? You're living from your value in other people's eyes? You're living from my truth? You're living from how great your circumstances are this week? You're living from my truth and your, as your security and your seal for eternity? You're living from your bank account and your 401k? What are you really pursuing? Are you pursuing your needs or are you pursuing his truth? Are you living from what you need? Or are you living for what he says is true of you? Because if I'm living for my need and he's just the means to my getting my needs met my way, then I'm going to be in conflict with him all the time because he loves me too much to let me keep those idols. He loves me too much to try to draw life from things that are by their very design going to bring me to death. Does that make sense? All right. The biggest flag of unbelief is being driven more by our needs than by his truth. A takeaway for this would be that all of this, this love that's causing mercy and mercy that's causing this togetherness with Christ, this life that we have with him, right? His love is causing mercy. It's because of his love that he gave us mercy, and it's because of his mercy that he's put us together alive with Christ. That all of that process is by grace, that salvation. Salvation is not a card that you sign or a prayer that you pray or saying, God, let me be in heaven forever. Until you have that citizenship, until you're reborn, your salvation hasn't even begun. But once you are in, then he begins to save you. And I spend my whole life being saved from what is death to me and living for... It's like being underwater. It's like stop trying to breathe the water. He's given you life. Breathe from him. Live from him. And he's continually saving me from me. He's continually saving me from my circumstances. He's continually delivering me from my lying beliefs. He's continually calling me to a hope greater than where I'm trying to get my needs met. He's continually trying to show me the value that I have in him so I don't have to live for the value I have with other people. He's continually trying to show me the power that's at work in me for what he is trying to produce instead of what I'm trying to be competent for, my power, my sufficiency, for what I want to produce. He's continually delivering me. So this mercy, the love that causes mercy, that causes togetherness with Christ and brings me to life, he's saying it's all a gift, lest anyone should boast. And that's salvation. Salvation is not God for you. God is for you, but that's not your salvation. God is crazy about you, but that's not your salvation. It's not just God for you. It's not even just God with you, though that's necessary for salvation. Without Christ, who is God with us, Emmanuel, there is no salvation. But that isn't what salvation is. Salvation is the grace sufficiency of God in you. The togetherness with Christ being brought to life. He is your salvation. And you and him. Him and you and you and him. That's together, right? You're no more in him than he is in you, and he's no more in you than you're in him. That's quite the mystery, right? 
right. uh, best examples I can have are things that are in each other that permeate each other. It's the tea bag in the water. I've given that illustration a lot. It's the, the cucumber in the vinegar. You know, is it a pickle now? I don't know. When did it become a pickle? It's becoming a pickle. I don't know. That's us in Christ. He's in us and we're in him. And he's changing who we are. We're taking on who he is. We're in, but we're increasingly experiencing and being transformed by our inness with him. Verse 7 says this. All of that is true. We're saved by grace, lest no one should boast, so that in the ages to come, here's the purpose, don't miss it, here's what God is doing, that in the ages to come, he, God, might show the surpassing riches. What is it surpassing, by the way? Everything. The surpassing riches of his grace in kindness. That's how his grace is demonstrated. In kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. God giving you what you want in your circumstances might actually be contrary to him revealing his kindness to you in Christ. He wants to reveal his kindness to you in Christ. Not his kindness to you in real estate. That's what we're dealing with this week. He does that also. But his agenda is not what he's going to give you apart from Christ. It's that he's given you Christ and you get to walk in the favor and joy of all that you have in Christ. And sometimes that is demonstrated by how good he is in your circumstances. And sometimes the goodness that we have from God and the person of Christ by grace is demonstrated by how great life is with him in bad circumstances. And his sufficiency is revealed both in his blessing to us and his blessing to us in circumstances that aren't a blessing to us. He's bigger than the canvas of your circumstances. So here's the question. What is God's end game in your life? What is he working toward? We have all these big issues that are looming large in my life, like tomorrow, <laughs> tonight. Big, right? Big stuff. Career changing, life changing, circumstance changing. Some of us, it's finance changing, it's career shifting, it's relationship shifting. I don't know what you're dealing with, but we have big things. Sometimes they're seasonal. Lately, they're daily. I don't know what God's doing. I mean, I know what he's doing, but I don't know what he's doing in each of those things. It seems like they're piling up on us this week. Some good, some not. Here's the end game. Here's the question. What is his end game? What is the purpose that he fulfills by such love, mercy, grace, and union, and power, and life in us? He's put us in life with Christ and brought us to life with him so that by his love, bearing mercy, bearing salvation by grace, what? What? The answer is this, that he, not you, that he might show the surpassing riches of his grace Surpassing every need, surpassing every other desire, surpassing your desire to be your own source. You'd rather have him. See, that's what he's trying to convince you of. That if you even could cause your own outcomes, you wouldn't. That's where he's bringing us to. Because Christ could have, right? Christ could have called the angels and being taken off the cross. And that's what he wanted, to not go to the cross. But he chose what God wanted over what he wanted and what he could have accomplished. For me, he has to limit what I can do so that I depend upon him. But what a great thing when in circumstances, one thing at a time, one circumstance at a time, as he continues to save me from the flesh that I have been operating in for so long and from the system that I've been in for so long, as he continues to deliver me from the old me. It's gone, it's dead, but I still live like it's me. A lot of times I forget. I don't know how alive I am. As he continues to do that, what he's doing is convincing me that I wouldn't even choose my own way if I trusted who he was even if I don't know where he's taking me. I may not know how he's going to meet my need, but I'd rather him meet the need than even my meeting the need if I could. And I can't. Even if I could, as Christ could, I wouldn't because of the character revealed in Christ of God. Does that make sense? If you could do anything that God could do, which is what Jesus could do, what what would keep you from doing it? Why would you follow him when you didn't have to? Why would you submit to him if you didn't have to? If you could meet all your needs, why would you wait on him to meet them? Why would you do that? Isn't that a great question? Why would I let him do it his way if I really could do it my way? See, he brings me to that place by my failure so often that I can't do it. But what if I could as Christ could? 
eventually because of the love of God and the mercy of God and the grace of God and the sufficiency of God and the power that he has at work on my behalf. I could give up even what I wanted to do, even if I could, for what he not only can do, but is doing, even if I don't know what it is. Verse eight says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. By grace, it is grace that saves you. Faith is the means that the, the grace saves you. By grace, you've been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. Your faith doesn't cause it. It is the gift of God. If I wrapped up a gift for you and gave it to you and it was worth more money than you could ever make, you know, here's a gold bar, right? And Teresa over here unwraps and goes, oh, it's a gold bar. And someone goes, why did you give it to you? Because he knew I'd accept it. No, I don't think so. That doesn't somehow warrant what he gave you. It doesn't make any sense. He's given us Jesus Christ and our receiving Christ doesn't somehow warrant our getting him. It's just his gift. It's just his grace to show how good he is. And what do we do with that gift that he's given us, that he said at the end of chapter one that he took all things and put them under Christ's feet and he took Christ and he gave them to the church, to us. And then what do we do with that gift? We go, great, now maybe I can use that to get what I really want. Maybe I can use that to get what I really want. Now, I don't want to put you under condemnation. In fact, I want to do the exact opposite because he knew that's what you would do. And that's why he saved you in spite of you and gave it to you and didn't make it up to you. I mean, it's not your doing, it's your receiving and your receiving doesn't merit his doing. That's why he just did it. So that now that having done it and you received it and with all my mixed up motives and all my trespasses and sin and all the death I still choose to walk in even though I don't have to, he can begin to show me not how bad the death is, but now in Christ he can begin to show me how good he is. That he might reveal through his gift of Jesus Christ the surpassing riches of his grace and his kindness towards us. He is wooing you because he always knew you would try to use his gift to be and do and get what you want besides his gift. And he's just trying to reveal to you how good he is. So you give up on all else that you want from him but him because he's enough. It's not your job. I'm not telling you to change your heart. You can't change your heart. He is going to persuade you. He is persuading you, isn't he? Aren't you even just a little bit convinced having heard that it's not your job to change your heart, but he is in the business of changing your heart? So when you look at the picture of your life, you're not focused on you or on the circumstances or even how well it's all going to turn out, but on him who is doing something beyond what you could ever hope or ask on the very artist of your life? Wouldn't it be great if it became about knowing him instead of how great your picture turned out for you? You? Doesn't that seem grander? Doesn't that seem like a bigger thing worth living for? I, I'm small. I try to get bigger. I don't know. I'm <laughs> naturally trying to take up more space. Okay. We got to finish this up. So here's my illustration in stark relief in the text. In, in verse 9. He just said it's the gift of God. Verse 9 he says... Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Neither your faith nor his grace speaks of you. Neither your faith nor his grace speaks of you. You don't get to boast in how much you trust God. Because that doesn't save you. Right? How great your faith is. The object of your faith saves you. Right? When you get on a plane, the next time you take a trip, I don't care how easily you get on and how confident you are how it's going to go, it neither helps the plane fly nor causes it to crash. It's how, right? It's the object of your faith, not the faith that will make you fly. <laughs> the chair that you're sitting in, I don't care how much you trusted it when you sat down, if you tested its legs or not, your faith in the chair does not help the chair sustain you. Either the object of your faith is the right object or it's the wrong object. And what he's trying to persuade us of is that he is the right object of our faith. It is not our faith that causes it, it's the grace of God. It is his gift. And neither your faith nor his grace speaks of you, it speaks of him. You and your context will speak of him. 
Verse 10. For we are his workmanship. You didn't even get credit for you, but you don't have to because he's given you his life and his value. You're his workmanship. He gets credit. He get not the guy in the picture. Obviously, he's not the one making the picture look good, right? Person that took the picture, that orchestrated the picture, that's composing the picture of your life. The composer, the artist is the one that gets credit for whether or not it looks good. Have you seen these Photoshop things where, you know, in 30 seconds they show how they've taken some slobby looking person that looks like, you know, they were just peeled off of something, barely, you know, alive, and they, you know, fix them all up and make them look like a supermodel. And the supermodels never look like supermodels. They just make them look like supermodels and make the rest of us feel bad. You ever seen that? And, you know, so they're showing you all the touch-ups they're doing and it goes from something, you know, one thing to an entirely different thing. Look, <laughs> he is not, he is not trying to get you to look better for you. He's trying to make him look good by what he does in your life. His sufficiency, his grace, your confidence in him. He's not trying to improve your competency, but your Christ confidence. And that will speak of him. Neither your faith nor your grace, his grace, I'm sorry, neither your faith or his grace will ever speak of you. It's not meant to. He's shooting a photo so that people go, I want to know who did that. I want that kind of a life done for me. Not, wow, where did he get that jacket? It's not about him. The guy in the picture. It's about the guy that took it. For his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. He's made you and the way he's made you is in Christ. And the reason that he made you in Christ is for good works, which God has prepared in advance. You're not finding them. You're not accomplishing them. They don't speak of you. He's created you in Christ for good works, which he's prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. And as he just said a second ago, with him. That we would walk together alive with Christ in works he's prepared in advance for us to do that by our letting him by our faith do by grace what we do not deserve. We could walk in works that he's set up so that in the circumstances he's put us in and in the you know, people that he's made us, we would be in a photograph or a piece of art or a piece of pie, whatever the art illustration, right? His workmanship, he's creating something that speaks of him and we're trying to get all the attention and fix all the problems and change the circumstances and compose a better picture and he's designed it perfectly to speak of him so that we could walk in the very works that he has designed you to walk in and them to be walked in by you with him. That's all it is. So that in our walk with him, our life with him might speak of him by his grace to us and our faith in him for his grace. It speaks of him. It's by him. It's for him. It's from him. And it's to him. It speaks of him. You are created in Christ for good works, but they're his works. What are you created for? Christ's work. You're created for Christ's work. But don't think that means you've got to turn around and be sold out to do things for God. It means that you're supposed to be radically available out of your confidence in Christ for him to do his work through you. His work. So that when he's working on you and he puts you on the wall, people walk by and think of him and see him and want to know about him. He's created a work of your life and of who you are because you are in Christ so that as people see you, they know him. What a great artist there is in your life. That's what he's up to in your life. The biggest revelation... Right? This is a, a lesson of big things, right? Biggest flags, biggest lies, biggest struggles. The biggest revelation for most of us is that God's glory is his job by grace. It's his job. His glory is his job. We are not trying to be what God has made us. We are what he's made us. We're not trying to live the life he's called us to. He is the life he has called us to. We're not trying to accomplish all that he's given us to do. We are what he is doing and the circumstances are the venue in which he, the canvas in which he's going to display his power 
his artistry, his sovereignty, his love and mercy, so that in his grace and sufficiency to us, whether it's through giving us good circumstances that speak of him because we can't take credit for it, or it's sustaining us and being sufficient for his supernatural joy and peace and patience and love and kindness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control, right? The fruit of the Spirit. Whether it's displaying those things in circumstances where they don't make sense at all, regardless of the context, he's put us whom he has made us in Christ in that context so that uniquely you will express something of him and his grace for his glory that that only he could accomplish, not you. His glory is not your job, or it would be your glory. But his grace to you is the only thing that will ever be to his glory. So what's our job? To let him do his work? To let him hang us where he wants us? To be deliberately on display for him to use for his glory in other people's lives? To receive his work in the context of it so that it can speak uniquely of him in ways we couldn't, you know, somehow mechanize. Maybe God really is enough for you. And maybe what he's doing in your life and circumstances really will accomplish his glory because his grace really is enough for you. And our job is not to get where he wants us. And our job is not to be who he wants us to be because he's put us where he wants us. And he's made us who he wants us to be. And we are his workmanship created in Christ for his works, good works. Who does good work? Not me. He does good work. He does it with me. And he does it with you. And he's prepared them in advance just as he's made us to walk in them by his grace and for his glory so that his renown is increased by how well he is gracious and works in us regardless of our circumstances. Isn't that cool? You're his art. And he's prepared circumstances in which he's going to use his artistry of you to bring about his artistry in others. You become from the canvas to the brush, right? You become useful to his work, right? He's making a beautiful museum and he's making a lot of great art to put us in. And we all together will increasingly speak of him. Isn't that great? Let's pray together. Father, it's hard for me to accept that the work you have for me to do is really your work to do through me. That's just a hard thing sometimes. But God, my job, I am increasingly convinced my job is to be available to you and to submit my agenda to your agenda so that you can do what you want and you can be enough for what I need so I can afford to be available for what you want to do through me that this circumstance isn't for me, it's for you. And my needs are not going to be met by what I do, but what you've done. And the value that I have is not going to come from how well I respond or accomplish anything, but what you have already done in response to my need and accomplished on my behalf. And that when you have raised me and you have seated me with Christ, that there I am in his finished work and his rest is my rest and his hope is my hope and his power is my power. Not because I deserve it, but because you, Father, deserve me. And so I am yours, not because I deserve your name, but because you deserve for me to be completely and totally yours. That our lives today, tonight, this week, this month, our circumstances, our homes, our families, our finances, our health, that God, they would all be the context of your workmanship that speaks of your artistry and sovereignty and love and grace of a God that the world that does not yet know you desperately needs and that we are here still hanging in this world on display for your sake so that they might know how dead they are apart from you and that we might come to know how alive we are with you. We pray this in your name, Jesus, and to your glory. Amen. Amen. Amen.